God despises syncretism, taking the practices of ancient pagan religions and thinking you can sanctify it to honor God. The New Age was exposed and the teachings were exposed in the 1980s, early 1990s. So the New Age cleverly morphed into new gospel, new spirituality. The New Age meets and merges, not emerges, but merges as the emergent emerging church. It's really the merging church. The new spirituality has nothing new about it. It's simply the old occultism that has been around since the Garden of Eden. It is found now in many different forms. It was called New Age. Now they figured out that's no longer a popular term. So they call it new spirituality. But in the church, we find it in many different forms. The emerging movement, the positive confession movement, the word faith movement, the contemplative movement, the uh, new apostolic reformation. So basically it's simply incorporating elements of old ancient occultism that devalue the Bible and are now surging and emerging, if you will, within the church itself. One thing that, that permeates all throughout those different belief systems is a movement towards an experience-based kind of Christianity. They want something that is different from what they can just hold in their hands or read in, a, in the Bible. They want something that is sensual. The Bible is really reliable and you always have to defer to the Bible, not to spiritual experience. One of the biggest movements going on in the church right now is how do we unite the various faiths? Um, so you find a great deal of outreach on, on behalf of uh, various groups. Roman Catholicism right at the forefront of it. Uh, but Rick Warren is a big advocate of this as well. And so the idea that we can merge varying beliefs since we all believe in God. Peter Drucker, one of the business geniuses who's helped develop many programs, he was one of the key mentors of Rick Warren, who used his uh, methodology of a three-legged stool, bringing in government, the financial aspect, and the churches to help bring in a new model for the church and to grow the church. It evolved into something that uh, was seeker-friendly, that wasn't interested in necessarily bringing in absolute truth or study of the word, but something that appealed to young people, that appealed to the felt needs of the individuals in the community. Hey everybody, welcome back to Magic Orthodoxy. My name is David and this is Cartomancy. Oh, Cartomancy, oh, what is that? Well, Cartomancy is fortune telling or it's divination using a deck of cards. So it's similar to uh, maybe tarot, what you're familiar with, but in tarot, you actually use a specific tarot deck to tell the future, but in cartomancy, you're actually using the European 14th century playing cards that you're familiar with. Again, cartomancy, it's fortune telling with a deck of cards. Uh, it appeared soon after playing cards were first introduced in Europe in the 14th century. Now, cartomancy uses a standard deck of playing cards it was the most popular way of providing fortune telling in and around the 18th and 19th and even the 20th century. Practitioners of cartomancy are generally known as cartomancers or card readers or sometimes just readers. Um, cartomancy is one of the oldest and the most common forms of fortune telling. It's similar to tarot a little bit, but it's... Pastor Rick, it's all about winning the hand you're dealt in life. So we're gonna play a little poker with Pastor Rick. You say five cards. Mm -hmm that can make up our identity. So right. what's first? Well, the first card is your chemistry. I call it your chemistry. And your chemistry involves your DNA, uh, your hormones, your, your biology, your health, your strengths. It's your body, because everything you're gonna do in life, you're gonna do through your body. And if your body's in pain, you gotta deal with that first. Right. If you've got allergies, that affects you. If yes. you've got if you've got imbalances that affects you if it, our bodies for good or for bad affect our identity so you got to start with that card okay so what's the fourth card in our hand now the fourth card is i call your consciousness interesting your consciousness is the way you talk to yourself oh good your consciousness is the story you tell yourself when you have a habit or i have a habit that i i don't like and i'm being tempted to go to this habit over and over and over the key to changing a habit is not to resist it, but to replace it. Not to resist, but refocus. If a guy's having a problem with pornography and he's watching TV, he doesn't just say, no, I don't want this, I don't want this. He just flips the channel. 
The moment you change the channel, it, the, the temptation loses its power on you. Do not, listen, here's a pastor telling this, do not resist temptation. Do not resist temptation? Yeah. Let me tell you why. Says the pastor. Yeah, let me tell you why. What you resist persists. But, because the whole time you're focused on it. What you need to do is just change your focus, and this is taking your conscious and saying, I'm going to renew my mind. Let me ask you this on, on several levels. Sure. You, you think, as a pastor, mm -hmm. that it is possible that people are born with a natural desire. It's possible. But still, it would be a sin that, that, that God would create a, a sort of situation whereby someone could have feelings and desires that are natural to them. Yeah. But it's still a sin. You know what? I don't have it all figured out. And what so, about the love part, though? Because the, the, I, I hear the age part. It's not illegal to, to love somebody, but you think it's a sin. I, no, it's not a sin to love somebody. It might be a sin to have sex with them. Wow. It might be. Yeah. Are gay people going to hell? No, not because they're gay. Everybody, we go to hell because we choose to reject the grace of God. The only way you can go so to hell is if you reject the grace of God. If a gay person, person accepts, accepts Christ. Jesus Christ, he's going to heaven. Okay. And by so doing, bringing down any emphasis on the gospel or the solid objective source of truth of the word, because that wasn't going to sell a church program. There is now a new reformation being headed up, not surprisingly, by Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, who is seeking now to bring his peace plan into a global perspective, where he hopes to recruit a billion people who will bring about the end of all the world's ills. When we look at the term New Reformation, we have to think of where did it first show up. It showed up with Robert Schuller, this 1982 book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, talking about God's dream. Rick Warren now has a peace plan that he calls God's dream for you and the world. Oprah is using the term God's dream. The Bible has told us that one of the signs of the end of the age would be a very clear, very deliberate move to an establishment of a one world government, which would be brought into a cohesiveness and a unity through a one world religion, a utopian religion. And it is not coincidental that the occultists and the New Agers for many, many years have been looking for the formation of a one world government a one world religion, which would bring a utopia on earth. What we see in modern ecumenism and the call towards all faiths becoming one and all the various Christianity becoming one, this is exactly what we know that the end times would be like. The idea of a consolidated belief system. The church somehow thinks in, in some quarters that it has the, the task of setting up the kingdom of God. It's Jesus who sets up his own kingdom. And we are the ones who inherit it. It's Jesus who ushers it in, not the other way around. We don't usher it in for him. The kingdom of God is not something that's made with man's hands. We aren't building it. It's not something that, that uh, we have a hand in making because the Bible says we inherit that. So how do you inherit something if you're the one who builds it? There is now a counterfeit kingdom of God that is being brought in by the radical Pentecostals and Charismatics who came out of the Azusa Street Revival, which then became, in the 1940s and 50s, the Latter Rain Movement. An offshoot from them became the Manifested Sons of God. And part of the aberrant theology from a man named William Branham, one of the teachings he had was that we were going to manifest as sons of God, we were going to become divine, and that we were going to bring in the kingdom of God before Jesus came. I really believe that a lot of the men that are involved in leadership in the church that are bringing these new teachings in believe that what they're doing is of God. For all I know, they have a voice that's directing them. They just haven't tested the spirits because I can tell you that what they are teaching is contrary to the scripture. Unless you are looking to the word of God, you have no way of testing what these prophets who are coming, predicting and prophesying in the name of God are saying. If you do not know solid doctrine, if you do not know the signs of the end of the age, if you do not know what the original in scripture looks like, how will you test when the counterfeits come? 
claiming to be from the word of the living God. Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California. Now, he is without a doubt one of the most influential evangelical leaders in Western society. And he is also extremely apostate. So this is a warning to anyone who is reading his literature, who is listening to his sermons or teachings. This man is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Scripture tells us not to be surprised by these things because Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and his ministers into the ministers of righteousness. So we must be on guard, constantly vigilant and sober for our adversary the devil is like roaming lions seeking whom he may devour. So let's take a look at what Rick Warren is saying and then we'll examine it in the light of Christ. We have far more in common than what divides us. When you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, uh, Fundamentalists, Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterian, and on, on and on and on. Well, they would all say, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the resurrection, we believe salvation is through Jesus Christ. These are the big issues. Sometimes Protestants think that Catholics worship Mary like she's another god. But that's not exactly Catholic doctrine. There's the understanding, and, and people say, well, what are the saints all about? Are, you know, you're, why are you praying to the saints? And when you understand what they mean by what they're saying, there's a whole lot more commonality. Now, there's still real differences, no, no doubt about that. But the most important thing is, if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. At this point in his career, Rick Warren is being used as a puppet and a pawn, a bridge between Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church, a false prophet working to undo the stand that the Church Fathers took against the Roman Catholic Church in the Protestant Reformation. He says the most important thing is that we all believe in the resurrection, we all believe in the Trinity, we all believe in the Bible, but that was never the question. The question is, what do these people believe about the Trinity? What do these people believe about the resurrection? What do these people believe about the Bible? We know that the head of the Roman Catholic Church believes that the Bible is mostly allegorical and that evolution is the means by which God created the universe. All right, so he starts this off saying, there is far more that unites us than divides us among the different sects of Christianity. And then he goes to list off some. And the first thing I noticed was that as he's listing them, he scoffs when he says fundamentalism. Evan Evangelicals, uh, fundamentalists. Now, some may consider this nitpicky, but I definitely believe it is significant. You'll see, these televangelist preachers will never call themselves fundamentalists because preachers like Joel Osteen, preachers like Benny Hinn are constantly in the media, and the media hates fundamentalists. In short, a fundamentalist is someone who believes that the Bible is the inherent word of God and literally true, not a grouping of allegorical stories meant to teach us some greater meaning. One of the main reasons that these preachers shy away from fundamentalism is because of the stance that you would have to take by looking at the Bible in this way on evolution or homosexual marriage or abortion, which are hot button issues in the culture that the media use to attack men of God. So instead of being the salt of the earth they are called to and contradicting this satanic culture with the word of God, these men often shy away from these confrontations wanting to be relevant to a culture that is against God. So you clearly have no problem with gay people per se, yeah. and yet you want to prevent them having the same rights to get married as straight people. And that leads me to, I suppose, a more obvious supplementary question. Do you personally believe that gay people are born gay or do they become gay? Are they made gay? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I think the jury's still out on that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me if there was, quote, a gay gene found. I am not an anti-gay or anti-gay marriage activist. Never have been, never will be. During the whole Proposition 8 thing, I never once went to a meeting, never once issued a statement, uh, never, never once uh, even uh, gave an endorsement in the two years Prop 8 was going. Now, let me just say this really clearly. Uh, we support Proposition 8, and if you believe what the Bible says about marriage, you need to support Proposition 8. 
I never support a candidate, but on moral issues, I come out very clear. During the whole Proposition 8 thing, I never once went to a meeting, never once issued a statement, uh, never, never once uh, even uh, gave an endorsement in the two years Prop 8 was going. Let me ask you this on, on several levels. Sure. You, you think, as a pastor, mm -hmm. that it is possible that people are born with a natural desire. Possible. But still, it would be a sin that, that, that God would create a, a sort of situation whereby someone could have feelings and desires that are natural to them. Yeah. But it's still a sin. You know what? I don't have it all figured out. And what so, about the love part, though? Because the, the, I, I hear the age part. It's not illegal to, to love somebody. But you think it's a sin? I don't, no, it's not a sin to love somebody. It might be a sin to have sex with them. Wow. It might be. Are gay people going to hell? No, not because they're gay. Everybody, we go to hell because we choose to reject the grace of God. The only way you can go so to hell is to reject the grace of God. If a gay person accepts, accepts Christ. Jesus Christ, he's going to heaven. Okay. Without a doubt. Okay. Fair, fair. All right, the next thing that he said was this. Sometimes Protestants think that Catholics worship Mary like she's another god. But that's not exactly Catholic doctrine. Now, at the end, he's kind of shaky with that. That's not exactly Catholic doctrine. Well, the four main dogmas on Mary in the Catholic doctrine is Mother of God, which was formed during the Council of Ephesus. And this basically states that Mary is divine. She is the Mother of God, or the birther of God. Now, we know that Mary was the virgin who birthed Jesus Christ into this world. But this does not give her any sort of special status above any other person, which is what the Mother of God teaching states. Next is perpetual virginity, which has been recognized since the third century. And this basically states that Mary was a virgin in the birthing of Christ and also throughout the rest of her life. When we see in scripture that Jesus did have siblings, I guess this would mean that none of these siblings were born onto Mary, which I just believe is not a true doctrine, but one that they try and hold to elevate Mary above again sin because it is implied in Catholicism that sex is sin, which is why they force celibacy on their priests and nuns. So we can clearly see how the Catholic Church is elevating Mary and worshiping her. And he clearly says after this, there's the understanding, and, and people say, well, what are the saints all about? Are, you know, you're, why are you praying to the saints? And when you understand what they mean by what they're saying, there's a whole lot more commonality. Now, there's still real differences, no, no doubt about that. But the most important thing is, if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. Now, while it is true that loving Jesus Christ will be fruit that we see in those that have been regenerated by the Holy Ghost and our children of the Most High God, this is another key point why we must be fundamental with the scriptures and study God's word. You see, we are taught that my sheep will know my voice. How do we know his voice? By reading and studying his word. This is how we make sure that we are not being deceived and loving a false Christ. You see, many people in this world profess to love Christ, but they are loving a Christ of their own making, a false Christ, not the Lord our God that was revealed to us in Scripture. There are Muslims that would say they love Jesus Christ. There are New Agers that would say that they love Jesus Christ. There are Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and all sorts of different people that say that they love Jesus Christ. But they do not love the Christ revealed to them in God's word. So this is a key way for us to be able to discern the goats from the sheep. Jesus himself, whenever a large crowd would gather around him, would speak the truth unashamedly, not worried about offending men, but speaking the word of the Lord. So much so that even his apostles said, these are hard sayings for us to take. And the Lord reveals to us that on that day of judgment, many are going to stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, these are going to be people that thought that they loved the Lord. They're calling him Lord, but he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So, I want to show you a clip from Rick Warren. Yeah, well, away, well, if, you got, if you got two doors, right. one says, this one goes to life with eternity with God. Right. And this one says, eternity without God. Right. If I walk out the door 
that says eternity without God. Do I blame God for that? No. That's right. my choice. Right. That's my choice. And so I choose to, re to, to go to hell. Mm -hmm. You have to do almost the impossible. What you have to do, you have to reject the grace of but, Jesus but Christ. Doesn't... Did you catch that? Rick Warren said, to go to hell, you've got to do almost the impossible. So Rick Warren says it is almost impossible to go to hell. That is a shockingly unbiblical statement. Dear friends, it is not almost impossible to go to hell. Everybody on earth is running to hell just as fast as their little fallen feet will carry them because that is what they want. That, they want the desires of their fallen human flesh and everybody is going to hell. And God in His mercy offers an escape. Scripture says that the, the gate is wide. The, the, the way is broad that leads to destruction. But the gate that leads to life is small. And the way that leads to life narrow. And few there be who find it. Rick Warren, in his presentation of the gospel, it's like, he says it's almost impossible to go to hell. No. Jesus said something very different when he was talking to the man whom we call the rich young ruler, the disciples were even more astonished at what Jesus said. And they said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus says, with men it is impossible, but not with God. Rick Warren says it's almost impossible to go to hell. Jesus Christ says it is almost impossible to go to heaven. And apart from God, it is impossible. With man, it is impossible. Dear friends, let, it, let us not diminish sin. Let us present the right gospel. Rick Warren is an American evangelical Christian pastor and author and the founder and senior pastor of Saddleback Church, an evangelical megachurch located in Lake Forest, California, currently the eighth largest church in the United States. Warren has been invited to speak at national and international forums, including the United Nations, the World Economic Forum in Davos, the African Union, the Council on Foreign Relations, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, TED, and Times Global Health Summit. He was named one of America's top 25 leaders by U.S. News and World Report. Warren was named by Time Magazine as one of 15 world leaders who mattered most in 2004. He is the builder of the Purpose Driven Network a global alliance of pastors from 162 countries and hundreds of denominations who have been trained to be purpose-driven churches. Founder of Pastors.com, a bi-weekly newsletter that is sent to more than 100,000 pastors and ministry leaders. An author of The Purpose-Driven Life. According to a Barna survey, the book has also been most identified by American pastors and ministers as the most influential book on their lives and ministries. When I wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life, and you asked about selfishness, the opening sentence of The Purpose Driven Life is four words, it's not about you. That is the most counterculture statement you can make. And it became the best-selling book in English in world history. It's next to the Bible, it's the best-selling book, and it's the most translated... It's the most translated book next to the Bible, over a hundred languages. As a philanthropist, Rick Warren is measurably improving people's lives around the world through his peace plan and other humanitarian works. It will change the world. He claims to be ushering in a new reformation in the church. But what is this new reform all about? Because of Rick Warren's profound global influence, his ministry deserves serious examination especially when he receives so much criticism for preaching a watered-down and superficial version of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his Purpose Driven Life book, I just simply compared what Rick Warren was teaching against scripture, line by line, precept by precept. My major concern with that book is that it is the way it omits the gospel. He has an agenda to teach and uh, often if it, that agenda can't actually be found in the Bible, he'll he'll go to a paraphrase such as the message and he'll find uh, something in the message or 
another paraphrase that says something similar to what he wants to teach. I mean, obviously, as you read the book, he uses dozens of different Bible translations, and he'll skip from version to version based on what sort of spin he wants to put on the text. He chooses what fits his program, and as a result, you don't get convicted uh, when you're listening to Rick Warren. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, on page 58, Warren essentially describes the gospel message as believe and receive. He writes, Right now, God is inviting you to live for His glory by fulfilling the purposes He made for you. Real life begins by committing yourself completely to Jesus Christ. If you are not sure you have done this, all you have to do is believe and receive. Wherever you are reading this, I invite you to bow your head and quietly whisper the prayer that will change your eternity. Jesus, I believe in you and receive you. Go ahead. If you sincerely meant that prayer, congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. Notice in Rick Warren's version of the gospel presented in The Purpose Driven Life, there is no mention of repentance from sin. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. The gospel message presented in the Bible clearly requires repentance from sin and faith in Christ as inseparable for a person's salvation. While Warren defines repentance as a mental shift, and to change your mind, repentance is most importantly turning from sin itself and turning to God. Jesus did not come to save people in their sins, but to save them from their sins. He did not come in order that you might continue in sin and escape the penalty, but so that you would be saved from the sins themselves. Rick Warren is very dangerous and here's the reason why. The guy is actually a genius, but he's using his genius in a way that harms churches. We went to meet Rick Warren in person because he wanted to meet his critics and find out why in the world we're against him. So I think the idea was, well, let's bring some of our critics out here, and once they meet me, they'll decide I'm okay. But what I did was I pleaded with him to start preaching the gospel. And I said, let me explain what I mean by the gospel. Then I preached the gospel to him, uh, the person of Christ, the personal work of Jesus Christ. And of course it fell on deaf ears. Rick Warren spoke at TED. I mean, he, here he is with an audience of uh, very influential people with an opportunity to say anything he wanted to say. And uh, that would be the opportunity really to give the gospel. And he didn't do it. He gave them a message of works, really. He said, God likes it when you be you. You know, you're wired to do a certain thing and you need to find out, look at your shape and do it. In the book, I talk about how you're wired to do certain things. You're shaped with a little across the spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, and experiences. These things shape you. And if you want to know what you ought to be doing with your life, you need to look at your shape. What am I wired to do? Why would God wire you to do something and then have you do it? If you're wired to be an anthropologist, you'd be an anthropologist. If you're wired to be an undersea explorer, you'd be an undersea explorer. If you're wired to make deals, you make deals. If you're wired to paint, you paint. Did you know that God smiles when you be you? And when you write a book that the first sentence of the book is, it's not about you, <laughs> then when all of a sudden it becomes the best-selling book in history, you got to figure, well, I guess it's not about me. And that's kind of a no-brainer. So what is it for? Yeah, he starts his book out, of course. It's not about you. But if that sentence weren't there and you read the book, you'd think, it is about you, you know, and when he gave that talk to the, the TED audience, uh, it was about him. It was all about him and what he and his wife did with his money. So um, we, we gave it all back to the back. And then we set up three foundations uh, working on some of the major problems of the world, illiteracy, poverty, um, pandemic diseases, particularly HIV AIDS and set up these three foundations and, uh, and put the money into that. The last thing we did is we became what I call reverse tithers. 
practically everything he said came across as a boast. You know, you listen to that lecture, and he had about 20 minutes there to say anything he wanted, and I would guess probably 18 and a half of the 20 minutes were all about him. He really didn't mention Christ a single time in that TED lecture. He, he mentioned the name of Jesus because he described an incident where a woman came and showed him a piece of paper and said she could see the face of Jesus in it, but he basically brushed her off and rolled his eyes and said, you know, what a kook. A lady came up to me the other day and she had a, a white piece of paper, Michael, you like this one, and she said, what do you see in it? And I looked in and I said, well, I don't see anything. And she goes, well, I see Jesus and started crying and left. I'm going, okay, you know, fine. Uh, good for you. He had nothing whatsoever to say about Jesus. Apparently, he doesn't even see Jesus in Scripture because that's not what he talks about when he gets the opportunity. So the good life is not about looking good, feeling good, or having the goods. It's about being good and doing good. The bottom line is God gets pleasure watching you be you. Why? He made you. And when you do what you were made to do, he goes, that's my boy. That's my girl. You're using the talent and the ability that I gave you. So my advice to you is look at what's in your hand, your identity, your influence, your income, and say, it's not about me. It's about making the world a better place. Thank you. I look at that and I think this sort of epitomizes the the whole seeker sensitive approach and and you know not just to pick on Rick Warren but he is the most visible and influential of the seeker sensitive guys and as I listen to him and watch him in these opportunities when he's on national TV or in a forum like TED or whatever does he preach the gospel and the answer is consistently no he doesn't uh, he didn't put it in his book he doesn't preach it when he has the microphone uh, and and I, that troubles me. I, it shows that there's something seriously wrong with his perception of what the purpose of the church and his purpose as a minister really is. What it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ is to say, I give as much of myself as I understand mm -hmm. to as much of Jesus Christ as I understand at that moment. And mm -hmm. then you keep growing in it. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, and in his video series, 40 Days of Purpose, he does not give a clear gospel. As a matter of fact, the gospel that he does give is very weak and very watered down. And this is alarming to people, many of them who went through the series, who do not know Jesus Christ and don't know the true gospel. For example, in his, his video series, I want to read from this, The 40 Days of Purpose, Warren leads his listeners in a prayer. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If you're not sure of this, maybe you've gone to church all your life, maybe you've never been in church, it doesn't matter. I'd like the privilege of leading you in a prayer to settle this issue, that you are connected to Christ. So let's bow our heads together. I'm going to pray a prayer, and you can follow it silently in your mind. Let's pray. Now, it needs to be kept in mind that at this point, Warren has talked virtually nothing about the cross, about the crucifixion, about the fact that we're sinners, about our need for salvation, about what Jesus did for us. Virtually nothing that, that a person who has very little knowledge of the Bible should know before they commit their life to Jesus Christ. And so, at, but at the end of the first session in his video series, he asks the people to pray this prayer at the end of that series. He says, I want you to repeat after me. Dear God, I want to know your purpose for my life. Dear God, I want to know your purpose for my life. I don't want to waste the rest of my life on wrong things. Today I want to take the first step in preparing for eternity by getting to know you. Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all, but as, as much as I know how, I want to open up my life to you. I ask you to come into my life and make yourself real to me. And use this series in my life to help me know what you made me for. Thank you. Amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to congratulate you. You've just become a part of the family of God. That is deeply disturbing to me because, again, he, he mentions nothing here about our need for a Savior, the fact that we're sinners, the fact that we're under the wrath and judgment of God, 
the fact that Christ died in our place, the need for repentance, the need for faith. None of these things and many others were mentioned prior to this prayer. And yet the prayer is about finding your purpose in life. Lord, I, I want to find my purpose in life, and I want you to help me find my purpose in life. And if you'll help me find my purpose in life, then, then that's great. And then he says, after you prayed such a prayer, then congratulations, you're now become part of the family of God. Well, most likely, such people that would pray such a prayer have no concept of why Christ died for their sins, why they need a Savior, anything along that line. And therefore, they're praying a prayer to find purpose. They're not praying a, a prayer to find forgiveness from sin and to be made right with a holy God. And therefore, I, I think this series definitely underplays the gospel. It makes it very weak. It makes it very easy to believe without even understanding our need for salvation. And therefore, it is very alarming and very concerning that people could take this video series, read the book, pray a little prayer, and think they're saved, when in reality, they don't know the first thing about why Jesus Christ died for them. I've seen Rick Warren in several venues where you, you desperately want someone who's going to preach the gospel. The TED Talk was one. He's been on Larry King and other network news programs where he's been questioned and interviewed about things like the meaning of life and what is the, what is our purpose as a human race. Great doorways through which you could drive a truckload of gospel truth, but he's, I've never seen him actually take the bait. I've never actually seen him make the most of those opportunities and preach the gospel. The closest he came was when he told Alan Combs uh, to give Jesus a 30-day money-back trial. But what, about, what does it say for all those people who do not accept Christ as their personal Savior? I'm saying that this is the perfect time to open their life to give it a chance. I'd say give them a 60-day trial. Even that notion that Jesus is someone you, can, you should give a try to, and if, it, if he doesn't do what you think he should or work the way you want him to, then you can just abandon him, I suppose. Uh, that's, that's the way pagans think. That's not the gospel. That's not something a gospel preacher should ever say. Is that a yeah, okay. 60, 60 day trial? 60 day trial. Like the book it's, of the month see book. if it'll change your life. I dare you to try <laughs> trusting Jesus for 60 days. Uh, do you, your so, money guaranteed uh, back. Uh, but, <laughs> really? Are you going to give me the money back? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so. Rick Warren's flawed gospel is only a symptom of a greater sickness, the fruit of the church growth movement of which he is a part. This prevalent movement within evangelical Christianity can be identified by a philosophy of ministry intentionally designed to effect numerical growth. The seeker-sensitive label is often associated with these megachurches in the United States where Christian messages are often accompanied by elaborate spectacles and elements drawn from secular pop culture, such as rock music and other forms of entertainment. Their methodologies are often more attentive to market strategy, business techniques, and demographics rather than biblical instruction. The church growth movement was founded by two people independently, Donald McGavran and Robert Schuller. Both men influenced Rick Warren. Rick Warren has readily pointed out that Donald McGavran brilliantly challenged the conventional wisdom of his day about what made churches grow. McGavran's 1955 book, The Bridges of God, cited in Warren's The Purpose Driven Church, is said to have launched the church growth movement. McGavran later funded the Fuller School of World Missions and Institute of Church Growth, an organization further expanded by C. Peter Wagner. While Donald McGavran could be said to be the intellectual founder of the movement, Robert Schuller is its most notable popularizer. Robert Schuller followed in the footsteps of Norman Vincent Peale, pioneer of the theory of positive thinking and most notably known for his book The Power of Positive Thinking. In his book Positive Imaging, The Powerful Way to Change Your Life, Peale mixes humanistic psychology with Christianity. Author George Mayer writes, He is also the father of the self-help movement that formed the groundwork for the church growth movement. Peel formed perhaps the most dramatic and meaningful link between religion and psychology of any religious leader in history. It is this same approachable, therapeutic brand of religion 
that many mega churches, including Saddleback, put forward today. It is this kind of religion that is so appealing to the masses of unchurched men and women that Rick Warren hopes to reach. In the 1950s, Robert Schuller began to integrate the positive thinking philosophy of Norman Vincent Peale with business-oriented marketing strategies. Possibility thinking was Schuller's form of Peale's positive thinking. Schuller adapted church growth principles to his own theology of self-esteem, which lured Southern Californians into his church. In his own words, Schuller said, Then I proceeded to spend about $50 for brochures. Hoping to impress unchurched people, I wrote to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote back a marvelous statement with his permission to quote extensively. So I grabbed hold of his coattails. Eventually, Schuler built the glassy Crystal Cathedral and his multi-million dollar television ministry. Author George Mayer not only explains that Norman Vincent Peale laid the foundation of the megachurch movement, but he also notes that it was Robert Schuler who helped create the effectiveness of the church growth movement on a national scale. Schuler boasts that two of his most famous students were Saddleback Pastor Rick Warren and Willow Creek Community Church Pastor Bill Hybels. Schuler states, Think about it. In 1970, where could a pastor go to learn successful principles for personal, spiritual nourishment and church growth? There was not a single source except the sometimes cumbersome route through the denomination. Our institute has set a new and respected precedent. Alumni include Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, and many, many others who found the fundamental principles of success at our sessions, and the rest is church history. Mayer writes, In the 1990s, following in the footsteps of Peel and Schuler, the leader of the next generation of church growth movement pastors emerged. That man was none other than Rick Warren. Rick Warren has publicly distanced himself from Robert Schuller and Norman Vincent Peale when he spoke to WorldNet Daily. I've only met Robert Schuller twice, I believe. I've never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, not once. So how do I even know him? He disavows Robert Schuller. Because when, when I was out there in person talking with him, he said, oh, Schuller's a heretic, I don't want anything to do with Schuller. And then so we said, well, I heard that you went to Schuller's Church Girl Seminar because, you know, that was written up in Christianity Today or somewhere. And he said, oh, I had won a contest in seminary, so that's where I had to go. I didn't really want to be there. But no matter how much Rick Warren and his apologists try to create a greater rift from Schuller, the influence is undeniable. Rick Warren's own wife, Kay Warren, confesses that Schuller had a great impact on her husband. Believers. Rick Warren writes, Create a service that is intentionally designed for your members to bring their friends to, and make the service attractive, appealing, and relevant to the unchurched that your members are eager to share it with lost people they care about. Though Warren may not see eye to eye with Schuller's heretical doctrine, the Seeker Model Church was adopted by Warren following in the steps of Peel and Schuller. As Warren recalls the early days of building his church, he talked about going door to door, not with the gospel, but with the following pitch. My name is Rick Warren. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to convert you. I'm not here to witness to you. I just want to ask you three or four questions. Question number one, are you an active member of a local church of any kind of religion, synagogue, mosque, whatever? If they said yes, I said great, God bless you, keep going and I politely excused myself and went to the next home. Warren has sought out to build churches that appeal to those who don't believe in Christ. He admits, I didn't want to color the survey with believers' opinions. Like Peel, Schuler, and Warren, Bill Hybels also designed his Sunday morning service at Willow Creek for unbelievers. We read that Hybels founded the church after surveying the community and designing Sunday morning services for non-believers. While the church growth model of church is intended for unbelievers, the New Testament church is for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
rather than transforming the world through the gospel. These churches are conforming to the world. Perhaps we could understand these communities better if we stopped calling them churches. If you know Jesus, I am sorry to break it to you, this church is not for you. Yeah, but I just gave my life to Christ last week at Elevation. Last week was the last week that Elevation Church existed for you. The standard rhetoric coming from these churches is that they teach the same message as traditional evangelicals, but only differ in methodology and philosophy of ministry. He states that uh, Bible prophecy is a diversion from the devil. Now, you don't want to study the Bible prophecy, even though a third of the Bible is prophecy. <laughs> Interpreting Acts chapter 1 verses 6 through 8, Warren says, When the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I have given you. Focus on that. If you want Jesus to come back sooner, focus on fulfilling your mission, not figuring out prophecy. Wagner quotes Robert Schuller and says, Robert Schuller's advice to young church leaders would seem to apply to new apostolic Christians. Don't let eschatology stifle your long-term thinking. Rick Warren's movement emphasizes deeds, not creeds. He also tells us about his ideas of the judgment at the last day, saying, God won't ask about your religious background or doctrinal views. But the Apostle Paul told Titus that a bishop of a church must be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. So once you buy into this particular leadership model, Rick Warren, who then you know brings along with him Perry Noble, Stephen Furtick, Mark Batterson, Ed Young Jr., Erwin McManus, and others, these become the guys that you look to. For, and all of them are, are vehemently anti-doctrinal. There's always some yahoo in the crowd who climbs up in this chair. And they don't get it. They climb up in this chair and they go, feed me! Wait, pastor, pastor, feed me! Over here! They sit here whining, oh, I want more, deeper, deeper worship. I want more Bible study. Feed me, feed me! You say, Perry, what about the jackass in the church? The jackass in the church is the person that always screams, I want to go deeper. You know what I tell people that say that around here? You're only as deep as the last person you served. You want to talk deep? Let's go check your tithing record and see how deep you are. Deep? Deep? Most Christians are, uh, John Maxwell said it, most Christians are educated way beyond their level of obedience anyway. What you're really saying is you want me to stand on the stage and confuse the heck out of you so you don't have to apply what I teach on Sundays. I could do that. I'm bound to make you mad. Did you show up to get mad this morning? Did you show up to file a little bit more religious information in your already overloaded hard drive so that you could do absolutely nothing about it? The church is full of pot-bellied Christians waiting to shove their spiritual food down their mouth one more time, but they don't intend to do anything to bless anybody. You are a Pharisee. The Bible tells us that the law of Moses was made for anything that is contrary to sound doctrine, for the lawless, disobedient, ungodly, sinners, unholy and profane. Thus, if the church growth movement is largely anti-doctrinal, the results are exceedingly sinful. Well, these churches were Baptist, Christian Missionary Alliance, Assemblies of God, Evangelical Free. They were all evangelical churches that were based originally on the idea of preaching the gospel. Okay, and then Rick Warren's program comes in, and he's telling them, "No, you got to change this whole thing. People don't like pews. People don't like crosses. You got to go out and find out what the average person in your neighborhood wants to do if they were going to come to church at all." 
And you've got to design a church that appeals to the unsaved out here. He drove the gospel out of more churches than anybody you can imagine. I did talk to Rick Warren, and he would deny that's what he did, but he did it. I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people um, that since I started writing on this topic, and they all said the same thing. Once Rick Warren's program came in, the gospel went out. Hymns about the blood and about the cross, they went out. Some, some cases, even the piano went out. I don't know that he set out to destroy the entire evangelical movement, but he pretty, did a pretty good job of doing it. You feel better about yourself. Well, God's goal is not to make you feel better about yourself. I know this is going to sound terrible, but he isn't interested in self-esteem. He's interested in self-denial. George Barna, the evangelical counterpart to George Gallup, says, Ministry, in essence, has the same objective as marketing, to meet people's needs. Christian ministry, by definition, meets people's real needs by providing them with biblical solutions to their circumstances. Lee Strobel says, the most effective messages for seekers are those that address their felt needs. Rick Warren also says, It is my deep conviction that anybody can be one to Christ if you discover the key to his or her heart. It may take some time to identify it, but the most likely place to start is with the person's felt needs. While most unbelievers aren't looking for truth, they are looking for relief. This concept of felt needs is related to marketing research being relevant and satisfying the customer. If we can convince people that Christ died to meet their felt needs, they will buy our product. But can the church borrow the marketing tools of the world and apply them to the church? Unlike cheeseburgers or coffee, which may have great attraction to consumers, the gospel is foolish to the unsaved. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Bill Hybels decided that the felt need that deserved most attention was personal fulfillment. While Schuler redefines sin in relation to self-esteem, Hybels adds a pragmatic twist to the definition of sin as a flawed strategy to gain fulfillment. But Jesus does not guarantee fulfillment as a result of following him. In fact, the direct opposite is communicated when Jesus says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Church growth, purpose-driven and seeker-driven pastors are seeking to please men by giving them fulfillment, self-esteem, and meeting their felt needs. The Bible warns against this. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be the bondservant of Christ. G.A. Pritchard also observes the psychological influence on Bill Hybel's Willow Creek Community Church. The psychological categories Hybels teaches, however, become fundamental categories for how Willow Creek Christians view themselves, their relationships, and life in general. Ironically, while Hybels is evangelizing those in the world toward Christianity, he is also evangelizing Christians toward the world. As the unchurched Harry in the audience, 10%, move closer to Christianity, the Christians in the audience, 90%, are often becoming more psychological and worldly. In Ladies Home Journal, a secular magazine, Rick Warren wrote an article entitled Learn to Love Yourself in March 2005. He told readers, to truly love yourself, you need to know the five truths that form the basis of a healthy self-image, which included accept yourself, love yourself, be true to yourself, forgive yourself, and believe in yourself. 
These are all pop psychology phrases and completely miss the mark of Jesus' teachings. While we are told to love others as we love ourselves, the scriptures also inform us that we already love ourselves in Ephesians 5, 28-29. We do not need to be encouraged in self-love that amounts to self-centeredness. In fact, the Bible declares self-love to be a sinful indication of the last days. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. A primary felt need of unbelievers is entertainment. These churches are designed much like theaters, complete with stadium seating, lighting and sound technicians, dance and drama performances in the sanctuary. Author G.A. Pritchard describes how Willow Creek is merely a continuation of the 1974 youth group Sun City. Former associate pastor Don Cousins explained that in many ways Willow Creek was an adult Sun City. Yet Sun City seemed to stretch the boundaries of youth ministry, writes Pritchard. Utilizing entertainment to appeal to unbelievers, the sanctuary was once decorated as a jail. Full-scale gymnastics were once used. They held the Hallowed Queen competition, where teenage boys came dressed in drag. Sun City's leaders explain, We are in the auditorium and the windows are open and the music is howling at ear-splitting decibels. There are flashing lights going all over the place with these big ambulance lights. There are kids literally bouncing off the walls, screaming at the top of their lungs. Everything that you would not think would be happening in a church sanctuary is definitely happening in a church sanctuary. Real display of power because we have professional motocross racer Steve Dennis right here, right now. And Steve, show us what it's all about. Give him a welcome, guys. Think he can jump this? Cheer for him and see if he can do it. Come on now, get him going, get him going. Get him going. Woo, yeah. So I'm praying one morning. I'm like, God, how are we going to start this thing out? I'm in my basement. I got my iPod. I'm lifting weights. The song by ACDC, Highway to Hell, comes on. I said, that'll do it. Now, I know, I, know, I know you shouldn't listen to ACDC when you're working out, but I do, and it's awesome. We know that entertainment is a product of the world, the world's substitute for true joy, and has no place in the house of God. This movement is allowing the world to define the church, rather than letting the Word of God define it. The Apostle Peter says, In regard to these, they, unbelievers, Think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Peter said that we spent enough of our past lifetime in abominable idolatries of worldly entertainment, and that we should no longer live the rest of our lifetime in the flesh. Nevertheless, entertainment is being brought into the church to appeal to unbelievers. Rick Warren describes how the purpose-driven or market-driven paradigm is a franchise system which any pastor can transfer to his church in order to replicate the same church growth results produced at Warren's Saddleback Church model. He says, Well, one of our values is what I call the good enough principle. A person doesn't have to be perfect for God to use them. Because we want our church to be a model for other churches, we want average people doing average activities in order to get extraordinary results. Just like how the typical McDonald's is able to succeed while being staffed by high school students. Because the system works, it doesn't require unusual talent. Thus, church growth principles may be practiced in any congregation to produce the same growing results of success. In fact, the conclusion of the church growth movement is that preaching should be judged by numerical results. McGavern says, In view of all this and much more evidence, must we not consider mission in intention of vast and purposeful finding? Is it possible biblically to maintain that only search is the thing? Motives are what matter. 
and the finding of multitudes of persons is something rather shabbily mechanical and success-ridden. Can we believe it theologically tenable to be uninterested in the numbers of the redeemed? I have seen 426 people baptized over a span of three weeks in our church this past May. No, no, no. No, 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 no. That wasn't a sufficient, woo! Because you have to understand that our church had less than 20 people less than two years ago. This morning we'll meet in two campus locations, Providence High School and Porter Ridge High School in Union County. We'll have well over 2,500 people that will attend our worship experiences. Since February, we've seen 600 people give their lives to Jesus Christ. That includes 18 that gave their lives to Jesus this past Sunday. At our high school service called Pulse. And if you're new here, you're going, why are they clapping about the numbers? Is it all about the numbers? Excuse me. Yes! Yes, it's all about the numbers. Yes, it's all about the numbers. Consider how it was Satan who provoked David to number Israel, and the anger of the Lord kindled against Israel that moved David to number Israel. Certainly then God is disposed with the numbering of his church, or basing the success of preaching upon numbers rather than faithfulness to the gospel. The Lord wants our trust to be in him alone and not in numbers. It is God who gives church growth, not according to the craftiness and wisdom of men, but according to his Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. It is the Lord alone that adds to the church such as should be saved. It is the conclusion of the church growth movement that God's will for every local congregation is numerical growth. In fact, Warren states, Forget church growth. Church health is the key to church growth. All living things grow if they're healthy. You don't have to make them grow. It's just natural for living organisms. But according to these church growth standards of numerical success and growth, many prophets of the scriptures would be considered the greatest failures of all time. Noah, for instance, preached for a hundred years and no one believed him. In the book of Revelation, Jesus never mentions church growth in his rebukes or his commendations of local churches. The two churches that were commended with no rebuke from the Lord Jesus were Smyrna and Philadelphia. Both of these churches were small, poor, lacking in influence, but were faithful to God. In the end, Numerical growth justifies the various methods of church growth pragmatism. C. Peter Wagner agrees, We ought to see clearly that the end does justify the means. What else possible could justify the means? If the method I am using accomplishes the goal I am aiming at, it is for that reason a good method. The seeker-driven and purpose-driven churches are adding secular philosophy and pragmatism to the gospel much like the Colossians to whom Paul wrote, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. If pragmatism is our guide, the church will be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Willow Creek released its findings of a multiple-year qualitative study of its ministry, with so many programs and activities in the church, Heibel said the results were earth-shaking and mind-blowing. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to digest as a leader because some of the stuff that we have put millions of dollars in, thinking it would really help our people grow and develop spiritually, when the data actually came back, it wasn't helping people that much. Other things that we didn't put much money into and didn't put much staff against is stuff that our people are crying out for. Heibel's multi-million dollar organization, which has great influence on other church leaders, has proven unprofitable in regard to spiritual growth. Heibel's confessed, We made a mistake. What we should have done when people crossed the line of faith and became Christians 
We should have started telling people and teaching people that they would have to take responsibility to become self-feeders. We should have gotten people, taught people, how to read their Bible between service, how to do the spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own. The church growth principles utilize the wisdom of the world for its foundation rather than Christ. Paul specifically warned of the dangers of building the church upon foundations other than Jesus. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. In contrast to the attractiveness and craftiness of church growth leaders, it was said of Paul that his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible, while Rick Warren says, we slander God's character if we preach with an uninspiring style or tone. The Apostle Paul said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. The Apostle Paul's message was never determined by the felt needs of his audience. His message was always Christ crucified. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul refused to let anything compromise his simple gospel message. I think this uh, seeker-sensitive approach to ministry, because, because it's so obsessed with the idea of making Christ seem appealing or cool or making the gospel seem as easily embraceable as possible, uh, often all of the aspects of gospel truth that might be a stumbling block to someone have been deliberately removed. Everything's deliberately taken out so that there isn't anything about sin and repentance or the justice of God and the, the the wrath of God against sin and the effect of that then is to draw people to respond and to unite with the the visible church who really have never been converted they've never really confronted the reality of their guilt they've never really trusted Christ for salvation from sin they think they're following Christ because they're following the Christ that's been portrayed by these pragmatic ministers and so they unite with the church and the effect of it has been to fill the church with false converts people who think they're Christians who probably believe they are Christians but they've never truly been converted they've never left behind anything that they loved before they've never really laid hold of the Christ of Scripture and loved him uh, and so they don't really believe him and they're unbelievers who think they're believers who call themselves Christians and the church is filled today with people like that and uh, so it's a it's a mixed multitude like the postmodern emergent church movement the purpose-driven and seeker-sensitive organizations have generally promoted the spiritual disciplines of contemplative mysticism one reason why these innovative market-driven pastors are promoting mysticism is because the world is looking for new ways to experience God. It's not just a matter of coming and sitting in a pew and enduring 50 or 70 or whatever minutes of, uh, of observing something happen. But it, it's, it's saying, I want to experience God. I'm interested in, in coming into an experience here. One leadership network study revealed that the fastest growing segment of the publishing industry were books on religion and spirituality. An outstanding trend is Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Another leadership network study says, why is mysticism re-emerging today? The emerging culture is less dependent upon a scientific and rationalistic way of thinking and has moved to a time when people want to experience God. 
On page 221 of The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren promotes spiritual disciplines. He says, These character building habits are often called spiritual disciplines, and there are dozens of great books that can teach you how to do these. On page 126 of The Purpose Driven Church, Warren lists five major parachurch movements which seem to focus on a single purpose that he believes is valid and even helpful to the church. Among these he listed what he called the Discipleship Spiritual Formations Movement. Among the authors included in this movement he listed Richard Foster and Dallas Willard who underscored the importance of building up Christians and establishing personal spiritual disciplines. This spiritual formation movement promotes contemplative prayer through the spiritual disciplines. In the Christianity Today article called The Emergent Mystique, emergent church leader Brian McLaren also named Richard Foster as one of the key mentors for the emerging church. Richard Foster and, um, and Dallas Willard, these guys are basically modern purveyors, and John Ortberg has picked up on all of this too. They're modern purveyors in, in what is centuries old. Roman Catholic mysticism. And so the idea is, is that you can have a direct experience with God if you do such and such disciplines. Rick Warren actually aligns himself and promotes the contemplative prayer movement. In the book Rick Warren and the Purpose That Drives Him, the author responds, nowhere in Warren's book does he endorse, refer to, positively mention or dabble in contemplative prayer. However, we find irrefutable evidence of Warren promoting contemplative practices and endorsing other contemplative prayer teachers. In issue number 56 of Rick Warren's Ministry Toolbox, he recommends Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. The newsletter states, Foster was a disciple of Dallas Willard. This book is an excellent primer of the spiritual disciplines that lead to a deeper life with God. In Richard Foster's own words out of the same book recommended by Warren, he says, We should all, without shame, enroll as apprentices in the school of contemplative prayer. Christian contemplative prayer is kind of a misleading term because people that are unfamiliar with it would think that it had something to do with contemplating in the old sense of the word, where you kind of think deeply on something. In essence, Christian contemplative prayer is about not thinking. It's employing a... Uh, word or phrase which is repeated over and over again for about 20 minutes. And you might ask, well, where did this come from? Well, it came from a group of mystics known as the Desert Fathers who lived in uh, North Africa and the Middle East in the early Middle Ages. And according to reliable sources, it says it was a time of great experimentation with spiritual methods. Many different kinds of disciplines were tried. Many different methods of prayer were created and explored by them, created and explored by them. So this idea of using a uh, word or phrase chanted or repeated over and over again did not come from the Bible. It came from experimentation and development from these desert mystics. Brennan Manning was also quoted in Rick Warren's Ministry Toolbox. Manning is most well known for his book The Ragamuffin Gospel which was once one of ten must-read books on the Saddleback family website. One of the major proponents of mysticism uh, in the church currently, uh, a man by the name of Brendan Manning, and he wrote a book called The Signature of Jesus, and he says if you do this kind of prayer, you'll have the signature of Jesus on your prayer life. So he says the first step in faith is to stop thinking about God at the time of prayer. Well, how can someone stop thinking about God? I mean, how is that the first step in faith? Well, the thing is, that is what mysticism is all about. You have to switch off your mind. You know, it's not intellectual. It's you're putting yourself in an altered state of consciousness. Then he says, contemplative spirituality tends to emphasize the need for a change in consciousness. In other words, your awareness is, is totally uh, switched into another realm. We must come to see reality differently. He said, and how is this done? The following, choose a single sacred word, repeat the sacred word inwardly, slowly, and often. This is usually done for about 20 minutes. So you're just constantly saying this word or phrase over and over again for 20 minutes. Then he says, enter into the great silence of God. Alone in that silence will the noise within subside and the voice of love will be heard. So he's saying to really hear the word of God 
you know, actual, not the Bible, not the Word of God as far as the Bible goes, but to actually hear the Word of God audibly, you have to go into this great silence of God to understand it. And that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with so-called Christian mysticism because these words and phrases are Christian in nature. Rick Warren also teaches this contemplative spiritual discipline in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, saying, The Bible tells us to pray all the time. How is it possible to do this? One way is to use breath prayers throughout the day, as many Christians have done for centuries. You choose a brief sentence or a simple phrase that can be repeated to Jesus in one breath. With practice, you can develop the habit of praying silent breath prayers. Jesus taught specifically against this spiritual practice or discipline of repeating words or phrases central to contemplative prayer. He said, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. The commands to pray without ceasing and to pray always are not literal as the mystics affirm because Jesus himself ceased from prayer. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, rather, these commands teach us to continually petition God as the persistent widow, a parable Jesus taught so that men ought always to pray and not to faint, not literally every moment of every day, but to never give up on asking God. Secondly, when asked how to pray, Jesus answered, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. When you pray, say. Therefore, sitting in silence or making breath prayers would be a direct contradiction of how Jesus taught us to pray. Yeah, I fear because of Rick Warren's efforts to promote contemplative prayer and mystical practice that Karl Ranner's prediction, prophetic uh, uh, view of the future is coming true, that the Christian of the future will be a mystic or they will not be a Christian at all. Because of these contemplative practices endorsed by Warren, many have connected him to the emergent church. I believe that Rick Warren was touting and promoting the emerging church even before it had that name. Since Rick Warren's popularity has exploded uh, and he did have an early uh, alignment with the emergent movement, that's created actually some problems for him and he's tried to back off from it. One of the recommended links in this issue was to emergent leader Spencer Burke's organization, The Ooze. Spencer Burke's The Ooze is described as a community that learns from faith traditions outside the Christian fold, with a Buddhist family in their church, with whom they visited a Buddhist temple and participated in guided meditation with this family. There's power in listening to the heretic, and today I actually think that uh, we need to listen to a few heretics in our world. When you go to uh, pastors.com, his, his website, uh, there's a uh, an endorsement of uh, uh, emergent books, there's an endorsement of emergent practices. Uh, in fact, Dan Kimball's book called The Emergent Church. He actually endorsed Dan Kimball's book on The Emerging Church. In fact, he wrote the sidebars alternating with Brian McLaren for that book. In fact, I'll quote to you what he says about that book, which I think it makes it quite clear where he stands with much of The Emerging Church right here. Warren states, quote, this book is a wonderful, detailed example of what a purpose-driven church can look like in a postmodern world. My friend Dan Kimball writes passionately, while my book, The Purpose-Driven Church, explained uh, what the church is called to do, Dan's book explains how to do it with the cultural creatives who think and feel in postmodern terms. You need to pay attention to him because times are a-changing, end quote. I almost have to laugh when people say, Rick Warren's passé by the Emerging Church, that's what's happening now. When they don't even realize that he's one of the main taproots of Emerging Church without him actually having the label. Considering how much these movements have in common, it is no surprise that Emergent Church leader Brian McLaren attributes his becoming a pastor to Rick Warren. He writes, I literally would not be doing what I am doing if not for Rick's impact on my life. Why would a supposedly conservative evangelical pastor like Rick Warren 
want to lend his credibility to the emergent church and have his name be directly associated with its leaders? The answer may be found in Warren's mentor, Peter Drucker, and Leadership Network, the organization that initiated the emergent church. Today I'm standing outside of the House of Industry where I'm going to go in and be the keynote speaker for the 100th centennial of Peter Drucker. On November 19, 2009, leaders from the business and public sector, scholars, teachers, economists, and representatives of the nonprofit sector from all over the world gathered in Vienna, Austria to commemorate the 100th birthday of Peter F. Drucker. Peter was far more than the founder of modern management. He was far more than a brilliant man, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. He was a great soul. For nearly 25 years, Peter was a mentor to me and had a profound influence on my life in the particular area of leadership and personal development. Peter Drucker was born in 1909 in Austria and immigrated to America in 1937. He was a writer, management consultant, and self-described social ecologist. Drucker had taught at California's Claremont Graduate School for more than 30 years, where the Management Center carries on his name. He published over 30 books in addition to articles for the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, and Forbes. His books and popular scholarly articles explored how people are organized across the business, government, and the nonprofit sectors of society. Before his death in 2005, he had a worldwide reputation as the father of modern management. In the 1950s, he invents the modern corporation. Drucker's vision was that uh, somebody who was part of a corporation, uh, the, the, the corporation that he structured, would, that they would feel part of something bigger than themselves. They would be part of a community and that they would be able to experience success along with the successes of the company and they they knew their part in helping to bring about what you know the the vision that the CEO had for the corporation and and since you know since the 1950s until now uh, the majority of corporations now work off of the Druckerite model expressing his own religious philosophy and the pantheistic influence of Buber Drucker writes society needs a return to spiritual values not to offset the material but to make it fully productive. Mankind needs to return to spiritual values for it needs compassion. It needs the deep experience that the thou and the I are one, which all higher religions share. This presentation would not permit the time to unpack the philosophies of Zen, Confucianism, German mysticism and existentialism. Drucker's own confession should suffice to demonstrate that he was not a Christian. I'm not the born-again Christian, no. I've been going to church and I've, and I've been tithing all my life, but I do not claim to be. And the best thing I, I wrote was an essay on a great religious thinker. I said, if you read one thing of mine, read my essay on Kierkegaard. It's the best, what? I have. It's the best thing I ever wrote, easily. Drucker's view of the nature of man is not derived from the Bible, but rather from the ever-changing social sciences. He created a new postmodern, non-economic man which is incomplete without community. Drucker's first book, The End of Economic Man, was written in 1939 after fleeing from fascist totalitarianism of the Nazi regime. Drucker wrote, the Western democracies have to realize that totalitarian fascism cannot be overcome by socialism, by capitalist democracy, or by a combination of both. It can only be overcome by a new, non-economic concept of a free and equal society. This new society became Drucker's project for the rest of his life. In the How did you get interested in the megachurches? Because I looked out the window. There was that phenomenon period. And I'm curious. But not from a religious... Huh? I mean, you were not interested from a personal religious point of view? Or? Uh, no. Uh, my interest in the megachurches was as a social phenomenon, as the... Uh, that, but 
talked about it yesterday, my old and abiding interest in community. I saw them creating community. To Drucker, his interest in the megachurch was purely from a sociological and economical standpoint. Denominations and sound doctrine was not a consideration for Drucker. Two, they were asking why he switched gears from um, the business world to the religious world. And he said, if theologians were, were left in charge of, uh, of, you know, uh, of animal biology, they would tell us that there's only one right finch in the world. But there's 243 different you know, species of varieties of finch, and they're all right. And if theologians would have us arguing about theology and doctrine and stuff like that, that doesn't matter. All of them are right. It was specifically Drucker's quest for optimum community which led him to the megachurch as the most effective agent of change in American life. Early years were spent on politics. The middle portion of his career was spent in the corporate world. The last part of his career was spent in religion, in Christianity as a whole. He took three disciples, um, Rick Warren, Bill Hybels, and Bob Buford of Leadership Network. Christianity. The Peter Drucker-Rick Warren relationship may surprise many, but it dates back over two decades to when the young Rick Warren came to Drucker for advice. Under Drucker's tutelage, Warren's own success has been considerable as his Saddleback Church has grown to be one of the largest churches in America, and his book, The Purpose Driven Life, is this decade's bestseller. He took the concepts from Drucker and created a system where he could reproduce his Saddleback to current churches. And so he exported this whole thing. What do you say to a group of Druckerites about Peter Drucker? I mean, I could easily stand here and rattle off a hundred Drucker principles and proverbs that you all know. Uh, and we all know them because they're all so memorable. But I don't want to talk to you uh, as we just close tonight in just a word not about his principle, but, but about Peter the man. I loved Peter Drucker. I didn't just admire him. I love this man. In my life, I've had a number of different mentors in different areas of my life. And Peter was one of those mentors. Peter Drucker was uh, a, a truly renaissance man. He, he studied widely, he read widely, and he understood society as a whole probably better than anybody uh, of, of his generation. Uh, certainly was brilliant, but he, he is often known simply in the area of management and economics, but really he had much more to offer than that. He was a keen observer of society and the impact of demography on society, the impact of social trends on society, the impact of spirituality and religion, and his uh, general consensus uh, attitude was, it all matters. Time. Within the Apologist and pirate Christian radio host Chris Rosebro interviewed emergent leader Doug Paget regarding the beginnings of the emergent church. Can you tell us about what Leadership Network is and who Bob Buford is and, and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff to start off with? Yeah, Bob Buford uh, is the uh, funder and originator of a network called Leadership Network. So I was hired to create what they referred to in internal language there as the Young Leaders Network. Got it. And it was young in relationship to the other networks that exist in Leadership Network. I don't think a lot of people really get this, is that you practically handpick the entire crop of current uh, leaders, both in the seeker-driven, purpose-driven, and emergent movements, all by yourself. you got Tony Jones, Dan Kimball, Mark Driscoll, you've got Rob Bell, uh, Craig Groeschel, uh, you know, Andy Stanley, all of the... Chris the, C., yeah. yeah Chris right. C., uh, uh, yeah, and a bunch of women. Leadership Network was really instrumental in helping to start uh, Willow Creek as well as uh, Saddleback. Is, am I correct in that? Well, not, not the churches, but they were influential in helping them think about creating um, associations where churches could learn from their particular models. Okay, so like the Willow Creek Association. Willow Creek Association, the 
per, the Purpose Driven Association. Okay, and um, and Buford, uh, he he's uh, he was really tight with uh, Peter Drucker, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Bob and Peter were personal friends, and uh-huh. Peter Drucker, who's um, a management guru to some people's mind, and a thinker on on uh, especially nonprofit uh, management principles, mm-hmm. had encouraged Bob um, to think about investing his wealth in supporting churches believing that one of the most under-realized and under-examined and under-resourced movements in North America in the 20th century was the advent of the large megachurch, mm-hmm. typically in suburbs and sort of non-denominational large megachurches. Considering the loyalties of Rick Warren and Bill Hybels toward Peter Drucker, it is no wonder that they have endorsed and promoted the emerging church a product developed by fellow Druckerite Bob Buford. Bill Hybels um, and Willow Creek played a, a very key role in launching um, Rob Bell and his church, Mars Hill, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. When you travel to uh, Willow Creek, when you go into their bookstore, they have an entire section of the bookstore dedicated to just about every single sermon delivered by Rob Bell at Willow Creek. You can purchase them. Every single NUMA DVD video is available. Every single book, and it's featured prominently. The reason why you will not, you will not hear Rick Warren or Bill Hybels publicly say Rob Bell Tony Jones, Doug Paget, and them are teaching false doctrine is because they have a vested interest in the success of their products because they help develop them. Leadership Network also was a very powerful force in all this. When I would call on somebody or go visit a church or you know go to an event and I would say I'm with Leadership Network, um, people tended to know what that meant. Uh-huh. Um, so it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't the Doug Paget ness so much as it was, uh, um, you know, the, the power of the position. You, uh, you had the clout of uh, Bob Buford and, and Peter Drucker and uh, the Willow Creek Association and the Saddleback Association all behind you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean it was like, hey, the, those are people, I know who that group is. They write some good stuff and they're, you know, they do some good things. Implementing the secular business practices into the church from Peter Drucker, who was not even a Christian, will inevitably lead to destruction because it is making Drucker's humanistic model the foundation for building and growing the church. Whereas the Bible teaches us that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, men can follow God's way or man's way in pursuit of church growth. May church leaders hearing this message be encouraged to follow God's way, since it is God's church, And Jesus said, I will build my church. Certainly, Peter Drucker meant well in his quest for optimum community, but his worldly business management philosophies in the megachurch and emerging church movements have acted like steroids being injected into the body of Christ, causing unnatural, monster growth from which the consequences will be severe and fatal. You can't talk community development without talking about churches and mosques and temples and synagogues. You just can't talk about it because they are the community. So my challenge uh, to you is, can we not all get along? What are the global giants in the world? What are the problems that affect billions of people, not millions? The vehicle to bring about Drucker's vision of a new society is Rick Warren's peace plan. Warren unveiled his purpose-driven peace plan in Angel Stadium before 30,000 church members on April 17, 2005. When he announced it, first they kicked off with Purple Haze. Rick Warren singing, you know, Purple Haze in my brain, you know, Jimi Hendrix's song about LSD. Jimi Hendrix talks about how he was possessed and songs just came out of him, you know? And here we're singing a song, not, not me, but you know, these guys are singing this song, Rick Warren leading with his band backing him uh, about Purple Haze and, you know, back to the 60s and that whole mentality of the age of Aquarius. And here he announces his peace plan. When I studied and read Rick, uh, Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan that he launched at the stadium in California 
with the song, the Jimi Hendrix song, there was nothing in that song about the gospel. Why would you want to launch a global peace plan with a pagan or an atheist, or, or, or there's the lyrics of which have nothing to do with the gospel? In introducing his peace plan, Warren said, My hope is for a new reformation in the church and a new spiritual awakening throughout the world. Warren also believes that the popularity of his book, The Purpose Driven Life, is an indication of this new reformation in Christianity. He stated, I believe that we are possibly on the verge of a new reformation in Christianity and another great awakening in our nation. The signs are everywhere, including the popularity of this book. But what is this new reformation, this new spiritual awakening associated with Saddleback's peace plan and Drucker's new society? In 1982, Robert Schuller issued a call for a new reformation in his book Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. Then in 1999, C. Peter Wagner announced a new apostolic reformation in his book Churchquake. But I want to remind you that the new apostolic reformation is the most radical change in the way of doing church since the Protestant Reformation. That's what we're, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're springing off into the 21st century with. Now Rick Warren is calling for yet another new reformation based on his peace plan to wipe out the global problems and make the church relevant to unbelievers. On page 48 of Brian McLaren's book, Everything Must Change, he speaks in favor of Warren's peace plan. McLaren says, Under the banner of a five-point peace plan, Warren called local churches to participate in a second reformation. This first reformation, led by Martin Luther, Warren explains, was about belief. This one will be about deeds. It is about what the church should be doing in the world. You know, Rick wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life that sold, it broke all kinds of sales records. I don't know how many gazillion it sold, but it, it really has been incredible. It was an incredibly significant publication. Now, what would really be interesting when someone writes a book called The Purpose Driven Life and they, they suddenly get huge amounts of money and fame and influence coming their way, then it'll be interesting to watch how does the author use all that fame, money, and influence, you know? What, you'll really see what his purpose is at that point. Not just what he writes about, but how he lives. And you know what Rick did with all of that fame and power and influence that came his way? He said, we've got to get people concerned about global crisis. He came up with a list of five. If you know Rick, you know it would be an acrostic, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Warren discussed his peace plan as follows. When Jesus sent the disciples into a village, he said, find the man of peace. And he said, when you find the man of peace, you start working with that person. And if they respond to you, you work with them. If they don't, you dust off your shoes, you go to the next village. Who's the man of peace in any village? Or it might be a woman of peace who has the most respect. They're open and they're influential. They don't have to be a Christian. In fact, they could be a Muslim. But they're open and they're influential and you work with them to attack the five giants. And that's going to bring the Second Reformation. When I go out and I start telling people, do you want to work with this on poverty, disease, AIDS, illiteracy, injustice? I often find people are more unwilling to work with us than we are willing to work with them. In other words, we're saying, you don't have to change your beliefs for us to work with you. If you can only work with people that you agree with, then most of the world you're ruling out. Right. Okay? I don't insist that a Muslim change his belief for me to work on poverty. I don't even insist that a, a, a gay person has to change their beliefs. They're not going to accept my belief or I'm not going to accept theirs. When I'm out working on trying to stop AIDS, I'll work with an atheist. I'll work with a gay person. I'll work with somebody who totally disagrees with me. If they want to work on an issue, fine. Why? We're building a bridge. Warren's peace plan includes unbelievers, Muslims, homosexuals, etc., setting aside differences and working together to fight poverty, disease, AIDS, illiteracy, and injustice. This, according to Warren, will bring about the Second Reformation. Thus, Warren's Reformation is a social reformation, rather than a spiritual one. And so the Reformation needs to be about what we, what we do, not what we say we do. In conjunction with his peace plan, 
Rick Warren is promoting the three-legged stool, a concept introduced by Peter Drucker as a means to bring together different sectors in society. Drucker believed that the only way to persuade the world to accept change was to engage the public sector of effective government, the private sector of effective business, and the social sector of effective community organizations, including nonprofit faith-based organizations. Over the last two years, I've spent a lot of time flying around meeting with every country we go into. We meet with the government leaders, we meet with the business leaders, and we meet with the pastors. We train the pastors, but we also meet with these other legs of the stool so that they understand they have to bring the church to the table. Uh, there's a role for uh, the public sector, there's a role for the private sector, and there's a role for the faith sector. Each of them can do something that, that none of the other three can do. Can we not work together uh, in building the three legs of the stool? For the last three years, I've been working on a prototype of this. It's called the Peace Plan, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Promote reconciliation, equip ethical leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. Peter Drucker, when he got involved with the mega churches, he came to recognize that one of the easiest things to put together, of course, as we understand, is the a world economic system. And we're about there now. That's the easiest part of the stool to get together in a one world order. The second part is the governance of, of that. That's more difficult. And it takes the crises to develop that. And then you take advantage of the crises that is created. But the most difficult is how in the world do you get the heart of these people? My feeling, of course, is that third leg of the stool is the last leg to be developed, and that will be a religious leg, a religion that is man-made and not God-made. If you are a global business leader, you need to understand that the future of the world is not secularism. It is religious pluralism. You may not like that, but you're going to have to deal with it. Warren's Reformation has little to do with preaching the gospel, but much to do with all religions setting aside their differences in order to solve global problems. The person over here who asked about uh, the millennial goals, I, I met last month with uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, to talk about faith-based organizations working with the UN on this and later you should talk to Tony Blair who's just formed a foundation he's much too humble to talk about it on this very issue to my brother Islamic brother here from Italy I would say I'm not really interested in interfaith dialogue I'm interested in interfaith projects we got enough talk notice how Warren's peace plan is distinctly different than Jesus's peace plan in Warren's project, Christians and Muslims are equally yoked together in ministry, whereas Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus' peace plan brings a sword of division between Christians and those hostile to the gospel, such as Muslims, so that a man's foes shall be those of his own household. This sword that Jesus spoke of was his word and the gospel that would divide households once allegiances were made to his kingdom. While Warren's plan is seeking to bring about interfaith peace and world peace, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Jesus came to bring peace with God through repentance and faith in Him, not world peace, as Warren's peace plan achieves. Just as Drucker criticized Christianity for being too individualistic, the church growth movement seeks to appeal to unbelieving people groups collectively. Paul Smith writes, The Fuller School of World Missions founding dean, Donald McGavern, introduced a new theory. He advocated that missionaries should not make a gospel appeal for a response from an individual but elicit responses from groups of people. This new missional theory appealed to unbelieving homogenous people groups to collectively agree to abandon their old religion, identify with Christ, claim the Bible as their authority, claim the church as their religious institution. 
An entire people group or society being Christianized cannot be equated with individuals one by one being born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth is an individual matter. It's individually coming to Jesus. But in fulfillment of Drucker's lifelong goal of creating a new society through the megachurch, Time Magazine reported, Over the last four years, Warren has beta-tested his plan by sending almost 8,000 members of his own 22,000 member Saddleback Church congregation and an undetermined number from 12 other congregations to work in 68 nations. The flagship project has been in Rwanda, whose president has declared his intentions to make his country the world's first purpose-driven nation. Simply called the Peace Plan, this ambitious effort takes Warren's purpose-driven philosophies to new heights. Rwanda became the first nation to sign up, thanks in large part to the country's president, Paul Kagame, and his unique relationship with Pastor Warren. This next step involves bringing the country's three sectors of society together to work on developing the country. The, the component of faith and Christianity, government and business. Success here means this peace model may one day be replicated in other countries. A possible goal is 68 other countries and Saddleback Church has sent out nearly 8,000 members in small teams around the world. I want to tell you, I'm more excited about uh, purpose-driven and the peace plan than I've ever been because I saw an amazing result in what I'm watching an entire nation being transformed because of you Saddleback Church the president was flat out overjoyed I spent two days with the president's advisory council which I serve on I spoke to a national prayer breakfast to about 400 of the leading government leaders. There was great enthusiasm. In fact, they've asked me to train their leadership. I had private meetings with the, uh, the president of the central bank, the governor of the central bank, and the prime minister, of course, with the president. Uh, and these men have asked me to do leadership training uh, for that nation with the government because they've seen what's happened with our pastors. This idea of a purpose-driven nation or purpose-driven country or purpose-driven society is no different than Emperor Constantine's intentions with the Holy Roman Empire. In the early 4th century AD, Constantine adopted the Christian faith for the entire Roman Empire. Constantine declared that the Roman world is now Christian. Christianizing a nation, an entire society, proved to be a fatal mistake. After Constantine's declaration, Christianity was mixed with the empire's existing secular beliefs and holidays, causing confusion which remains today. As Rick Warren launched the Purpose Driven Living in Uganda campaign, the following press release also spoke of the Purpose Driven Country and the Purpose Driven Continent. Pastor Rick has partnered with the President and others to make Rwanda a Purpose Driven Country. I ask why not Uganda as well? Archbishop Arombi challenged an unprecedented gathering of 450 national leaders at a banquet gathered to hear Dr. Warren speak. Uganda should be a purpose-driven nation as well, but it takes people of purpose to build purpose-driven churches, purpose-driven communities, and a purpose-driven country. Someday we will have a purpose-driven continent. You know, we told uh, the Rwandans about our next goal, now that we've gone to every nation, we're now going to go to the 3,800 unengaged people groups, these small tribes that don't have a, uh, any church in it between now and the end of the decade. While Warren's plan for changing and reaching the world are very noble, it is dreadful to think that the watered-down, easy-believism version of the gospel is not only being spread all over the world, but now going to be proclaimed to unreached people groups of the world. With worldly nations like Rwanda and Uganda becoming purpose-driven nations through the peace plan, the Apostle John tells us, They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. James 4.4 4 declares, 
Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Yet Warren's peace plan and new society envisioned by his mentor Peter Drucker is increasingly embraced by politicians, celebrities, and world leaders. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, which the Council on Foreign Relations is seeking to build a new world order. And at first he just blatantly denied that he was a member of the CFR. And then later it came out that, yeah, he was a member and admitted that he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So his peace plan is, is, is very, very uh, scary as it fits into the, this whole ecumenical movement, this whole God's dream, kingdom, dominion, new world order, and where the church is headed at this time. Even President Obama sparked controversy when he asked Rick Warren to lead the prayer at the presidential inauguration in January of 2009. And then you have Rick Warren at Barack Obama's you know, inaugural prayer doing the inaugural prayer and he's praying in the name of Isa at one point. I humbly ask this in the name of the one who changed my life, Yeshua, Isa, Jesus, Jesus. Isa is, is not the Jesus of the Bible, Isa is the Jesus of the Quran, which is a different Jesus again who didn't die for our sins and who is not God in the flesh, is not the Son of God. Uh, and then you have him also addressing the ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. Which just a couple years prior to that was designated by the Justice Department as, as a terrorist group or funding terrorism. And he doesn't give them the gospel. Somebody say, well, yeah, he came to preach Jesus to them, you know, and hey, you know, praise God, I'd, I'm all for standing up at the gates of hell and proclaiming the gospel. That would be awesome. But that's not what happened. He encourages them on how to be successful. Uh, now, <laughs> when you look at what Islam teaches about ultimate success in the Quran is the domination over every other religion of Islam, by Islam, through the use of jihad and if you're, you know, going out your, against your enemy and slaying him wherever you find him. And, and Christians are allowed to live as long as they submit to Islam and, and pay, pay the toll tax, you know. Uh, otherwise, they're persecuted, they're beheaded. Uh, so it's getting really sad as to where this is all headed because these are the leaders of the visible professing church working with Muslims to bring this new world order about. I was asked to see to you about how can Muslims and Christians work closer together for the greater good in our world. And I will tell you that I'm not interested in interfaith dialogue. I am interested in interfaith projects. There's a big difference. Recently, an article from the Orange County Register was published entitled Rick Warren Builds Bridge to Muslims. It described how Warren is part of an effort named King's Way that is attempting to bring evangelical Christians and Muslims together. The Reverend Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in Lake Forest and one of America's most influential Christian leaders, has embarked on an effort to heal divisions between evangelical Christians and Muslims by partnering with Southern California mosques and proposing a set of theological principles that includes acknowledging that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. The news went viral on the web when many bloggers and critics of Warren responded. In anticipation of a second article from the Orange County Register, Saddleback offered a preemptive strike in Warren's defense in which Warren stated, A week ago a reporter published an article in the Orange County Register about Saddleback Church that contained many errors and false assumptions. It erroneously stated that we have a partnership with a local Muslim mosque. That is false. However, the second OCR article confirms that Saddleback did indeed partner with a local Muslim mosque. In a February 10th interview with the Register, Tom Holliday, associate senior pastor at Saddleback, described the outreach to Muslims as a multi-pronged effort that includes sharing meals at mosques during religious holidays and working together with Muslims on joint community service projects. Warren continued, It erroneously reported that our church had agreed to a theological document with Muslims. The document, titled King's Way, co-authored by Abraham Muhlenberg, a Saddleback pastor in charge of interfaith outreach, and Jihad Turk, director of religious affairs of the Islamic Center of Southern California, was presented at a December dinner at Saddleback attended by 300 Christians and Muslims. The Islamic Center of Southern California, 
the website for Turks Mosque, published a blog post entitled ICSC co-authors historic interfaith document that demonstrates the new theological position of Saddleback. It featured a photo of Turk and Muhlenberg addressing the Saddleback audience beneath a projection on a screen with the heading King's Way. Saddleback has affirmed that the photograph was taken at Saddleback, more specifically the Saddleback Peace Center. The projected slide says King's Way. King's Way describes a path to end the 1400 years of misunderstanding between Muslims and Christians by consulting the texts we each call sacred to form a basis that allows us the privilege to serve the needs of our community together. Nevertheless, Warren went on in his defense stating, It erroneously reported that we had agreed to not evangelize with Muslims. That is false. However, the second Orange County Register article notes, Tom Holliday, associate senior pastor at Saddleback, said the purpose of the effort was not to convert Muslims, but rather to work together to serve the community. Asked if the effort was done with Warren's knowledge and approval, Holliday replied, of course it has his approval. The very definition of partnership is working together. And this is what Saddleback is doing with Muslims to serve the community. The Bible says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together? unless they are agreed. Jihad Turk, Kingsway co-author, had emphasized that Muslims agreed to participate in the Saddleback outreach effort because members of both faiths agreed our purpose is not to convert one another, but rather to work on ways to make the world a better place by breaking down walls of misunderstanding. The testimonies do not match up with that of Rick Warren's. Warren continues, it erroneously reported that we believe Saddleback and Muslims worship the same God. That is false. A person attending the King's Way meeting could easily have come to the conclusion that Muslims and Christians worship the same God based on the vague language of the document itself, saying, We believe in one God. God is one, and God is the Creator. With support for each of these claims from the Bible and the Quran, David Sean. Warren's chief of staff told Jim Hinch and a register editor that the story was factually correct except in its statement that Warren believes Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Rather, Sean said that it would be more accurate to state that Christians and Muslims both believe in one God. Apparently, Sean asked the OCR to publish a correction to the article but later withdrew the request. Warren has stated, Neither I nor my staff had ever seen such a document until the article mentioned it. It wasn't created or even seen by us. Saddleback Church as a church was not involved. Obviously David Sean, Tom Holliday, and Abraham Muhlenberg, all members of Saddleback staff, all knew about Kingsway prior to the article being published. The public statements and photographic evidence do not corroborate Warren's defense. Amy Spreeman of Stand Up For The Truth published an article entitled, Why Is Saddleback Pastor Teaching On The Kingdom Circles? Which provides the context of why Jihad Turk is working with Saddleback. Saddleback Pastor Abraham Muhlenberg spoke at an event in France in June 2012. In the diagram behind him, the kingdom circles are part of the session. The kingdom circles are a simple but highly questionable evangelical tool that people are being taught to draw in order to demonstrate how those of other faiths can enter the kingdom of God without converting to Christianity. The kingdom of God. Or in Arabic you could say, Malakut Allah. Now if this circle represents Christians, this circle represents Muslims, what's happened for so many years is that Christians have been telling Muslims, you've got to come over into our circle, become a Christian. That's the only way you can come into the kingdom of God. Or Muslims have been saying, hey, come over here, you've got to become a Muslim. That's how, that's how you really know God and, and are able to uh, move in the right direction. But really, those things aren't the issue. The real issue is how can we both move into the kingdom of God and find the straight path to God? That is the question.
A common word between us and you is a global interfaith initiative that began as an open letter in October 2006. A common word between us and you proposes love of God and love of neighbor as the common ground between Christianity and Islam. That were written when the Muslims wrote first and then you have the professing Christian response is about unification and that we can only be one if we agree that we're worshiping the same God. In the summary of a common word between us and you it states the basis for this peace and understanding already exists. It is part of the very foundational principles of both faiths. Love of the one God. The Christian response letter also refers to God of the Muslim tradition as if the Muslims worship the same God as Christians. While Islam claims to worship one God, the response letter does not address the profound differences between the one God of the Bible and Allah they signed the response that Yale Divinity School put back, which included uh, affirmation that Muhammad was the prophet. Since they did not refute the statement that the Bible and the Quran are both of divine origin, they were affirming that as well. I believe it's the greatest betrayal in the history of Christianity by professing Christian leaders. What's really just tragic about this is the Quran nine different times denies, nine different times that Jesus is the Son of God. Denies it. Now how can you deny the incarnation, God in the flesh, and deny that Jesus is God and say that we have the same God? How can you deny that God is triune? Deny Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and claim that we worship the same God. You really can't. And, and Muslims recognize ultimately that uh, we have to deny the Trinity. In fact, the common word document is based on a surah, a verse in the Quran, which states emphatically to make a common word between us and them, the Christians that calls the people of the book, and get them to deny or not to say that God is three or that they're, God is triune. Now think about this. You're having Muslims write a document based upon a surah that joins them to go to Christians to get them to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, to deny the Trinity, to make a common word based on that surah. They call it a common word between us and you. Christians, professing Christians, write back, like Rick Warren and Brian McLaren, sign and agree that, hey, yeah, we all worship the same God, you know, i.e., loving God and neighbor together, meaning we're loving the same God. Therefore, we can hope to have world peace. And it's compromised in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though Christians may be in agreement with Muslims about finding common ground and not desiring strife, violence, and war, it is on the basis of the person of Jesus Christ that Christians do not kill. The love of God is uniquely expressed in Christ dying for our sins upon the cross and raising again which Islam rejects. The Bible is clear that whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Muslims reject Jesus as the crucified and risen Son of God and Savior of the world. Therefore Muslims are rejecting God. Christians and Muslims do not stand together on common ground or understanding of God or the love of God. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. While Jesus teaches to love one's enemies and be at peace with all men, Christians are not to set aside profound differences in the name of world peace. Any peace without Christ is futile in the scope of eternity. And we put all these things together and we realize that 1 John 2.22 identifies uh, Antichrist. And there are many Antichrists that have come and that will come again. There's an ultimate Antichrist as well. Is a denial that spirit is a denial of the Father and the Son. And again, this is the movement that we're witnessing before our very eyes. And we're seeing much of Christendom being swept up into it through the purpose-driven movement, through the emerging church movement, through the seeker-sensitive movement. Nobody denies the need for social reform, but it is a shameful compromise of the Great Commission to replace the gospel with social, economic, and political reforms. Warren's noble efforts for global reformation will bring wisdom discipline, order, health, education, and security, but it will not bring life. Indeed, it will keep countless from God's kingdom, 
by deluding them into rejoicing contentedly over a refreshing glass of old wine. They will believe they have found God, but will only have been brought closer to godly principles. There is no life in the mere influence of God, only in His presence, and that life requires death toward all that the world loves. There are many passages in the Word that clearly describe what the world's reaction will be to the gospel and how we will be treated and regarded because of the gospel. The nature of Rick Warren's program and message is defined by how the world reacts to it. Warren is reaching people groups with information, organization, ideas, and even inspiration. His team is doing many good works in Jesus' name. The enemy is happy to have us doing good things, so long as we do them without the presence of God. We will all see on the last day who truly knows the Lord. Indeed, the church growth movement may gain the world by compromising the gospel. But Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels.